A head-up display, or HUD, is a method of presenting flight information and guidance so that it appears in the sight line of a pilot looking out of the windscreen. Its primary advantage is that a pilot does not have to transfer his gaze between the viewer head and the traditional head-down instruments, especially at a critical phase of flight. It is particularly useful during takeoff in low visibility conditions, when only a few hundred feet of runway may be visible, but the pilot still wishes to see it, at least until airborne, before transferring to instruments. Similarly, on landing, especially on Category 3 ILS approaches, it enhances safety by allowing immediate reorientation to external information as soon as the runway becomes visible. Use of the HUD can therefore avoid the need for split approaches, where one pilot flies the aircraft on instruments whilst the other looks out until he sees the runway, then takes over. However, it is also useful during route flying because it is important that pilots look out as much as possible. Visual sighting still makes an important contribution to en route collision avoidance. The earliest head up displays were military and were primarily concerned with weapon aiming. Since then, there has been continuous evolution. The components of the system vary depending on its age, but the initial versions designed for civil aircraft comprise a display controller, a display guidance computer, an overhead unit, and a combiner. The main purpose of the display controller is to allow the pilot to select the various modes of operation available. We will look at some of these later. The display guidance computer takes the flight guidance information and symbol generation data from the EFIS and combines it in a form suitable for the HUD display. The generic term for the symbols generated is symbology and it looks like this. The overhead unit is simply a special purpose projector which sends the symbology generated by the guidance computer to the combiner which is a fold-away glass see-through screen mounted in front of the pilot. It is angled and designed in such a way that it reflects the monochromatic projected light towards the pilot without interfering from the ambient light at all other wavelengths which is coming from ahead. There is also an ambient light sensor, similar in principle to the one employed in EFIS, to automatically control the brightness of the HUD presentation assembly. It maintains the initial brightness level selected by the pilot and therefore adjusts for changing flight deck light conditions during the flight. It is important that the symbology presented to the pilot must appear to be focused a long distance away. Otherwise the eyes would have to change focal length when switching between the outside world and the data on the head-up display, which would defeat the whole object of having the HUD. The light projected by the overhead unit is actually focused at infinity. This is achieved by designing the projector as a collimator. A collimator is an optical device which usually incorporates a curved mirror or lens with the light source and image at its focus. This arrangement replicates a target at infinity. A secondary advantage is that there is no parallax. Parallax on normal instruments is simply caused by viewing the instrument from slightly to one side instead of from the front. Because the light path from the combiner is so directional, it is important that it is correctly positioned to meet the pilot's eyes. The ideal position for the image to meet the eye is called the eye reference point. However, there is some scope for head movement. The display can be viewed whilst the pilot's eyes are within a three-dimensional area, which is approximately five inches wide, three inches high and six inches deep, called the eye box. The pilot can see the entire display as long as one of his eyes is within the eye box. The eye box can also be called the head motion box. Conformity means that when a symbolic object is projected onto the combiner and the actual object that it represents is visible through the windscreen, they will appear in the same place. 
the computer has to have the capacity to turn its stored data about any external objects which the pilot may see into a HUD image which has the correct perspective for the object size and its range from the aircraft. Here we see the symbology for the correct approach centerline. Here are the runway edges. And this is the horizon. It is essential that the data generated on the HUD is very accurately aligned with external data. This process of correctly aligning is called bore sighting. Typical bore sighting accuracy is plus or minus 7 milliradians or less than half a degree. This display is very much on the limits of what is acceptable. You can see that if the misalignment were to get any worse, the moment that the runway first became visible might be disorientating. There are currently four generations of HUD technology. The first uses a cathode ray tube to generate the symbology. This is the system still in use in most current HUDs. However, these systems are subject to fade and they require high voltages. Second generation systems replace the cathode ray tube by a solid state light source such as a liquid crystal display. This saves weight and does not need high voltages, thereby avoiding unwanted heat generation. It also largely overcomes the fade problem. These two are in current aircraft. Third generation systems remove the need for the overhead projector. Optical waveguides produce the image directly in the combiner. With these systems, eye reference point is less critical since the eye box is larger. These are just emerging in aircraft. Fourth generation systems dispense with the combiner altogether. The entire windscreen is used as a transparent display. It has a phosphor coating which reacts when a small laser projects directly onto it, producing images and even video imagery directly onto the windscreen. These are currently being developed for cars, but aircraft applications will almost certainly follow shortly. Because HUDs are fitted only to aircraft which have other advanced electronics, such as air data computers, FMS and EFIS, there is a wealth of information that could be displayed. Every HUD will show information from the Air Data Computer, or ADC, the Inertial Reference Unit, or IRU, the Radio Altimeter, the Radio Navigation Instruments, and the Flight Management System, or FMS. However, the Display Guidance Computer can also be programmed to show information from the Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System, TCAS, the Wind Shear Warning System, the Microwave Landing System, or MLS, if fitted, and the Global Positioning System, or GPS. What is actually available on any particular display will depend on the manufacturer and the customer's requirements. The flexibility of modern avionics makes it possible to tailor the displays to any individual airline or aircraft type. This list shows some of the options which may be selected. As you can see, it is a long one, and you are not expected to remember it by heart. Indeed, it is not exhaustive, and as technology emerges, new ones may be added. As we said earlier, HUD displays vary with manufacturer and customer. Therefore, a detailed study of the available symbology on any particular system will be best covered during your type conversion. We will look at some of the more widely used formats here in order to give you a general idea of what is available, but you should not try to remember these in detail at this stage. We'll start with a conformal display. Here is the airport symbol. And here is the bore site. This is the roll scale, which shows angle of bank. And these are the roll pointer and slip or skid indicators. There is an altitude display. And an altitude dial. 
An analog worm display gives us vertical speed information. However, one of the most important symbols is the flight path vector. This shows the direction in which the aircraft is flying. This is not necessarily the same thing as the aircraft's attitude. For instance, an aircraft can be pitched nose up. But if the speed is low, it may be descending, as happens, for instance, on an approach to land. The advantage of the flight path vector is that the pilot can fly the aircraft to put the symbol on the desired touchdown point and the aircraft will fly there. This is quite unlike an attitude indicator. This calculation of flight path vector has only become possible recently now that computer technology is used in modern instrumentation. The airport symbol changes to a runway symbol as the aircraft descends through 325 feet. And below 100 feet on the radio altimeter, a flare guidance cue becomes active. This moves up to the flight path vector from below until the wings of the aircraft symbol fit in between the two bars. A long and a cross track wind vectors can be shown. This is particularly useful during landing and takeoff. There is an airspeed digital display and also an analog display which can be bugged. Once in the climb or cruise, a horizontal situation indicator can be displayed. Pause the display if you want time to look at all the symbols and labels and continue when you are ready. And this is a non-conformal display, which might be a useful option in the cruise. Again, pause if you want to. A traffic alert and collision avoidance system, or TCAS, can also be selected. Basically, just about any information generated within the aircraft can be displayed if the customer requires it. Two operating problems have come to light with the introduction of HUD technology, although the benefits gained greatly outweigh these limitations. The first is attention capture, also known as tunneling. Pilots can concentrate on the HUD data and disregard external, real, visual information. The second is that it is possible for the display imagery to obscure or cover important external real features. The solution is to not overclutter the display. However, there is a balance to be struck between keeping the display uncluttered and providing enough information to the pilot. Second generation and third generation systems use a liquid crystal display instead of a cathode ray tube. The primary reasons for this were to save weight, reduce picture fade and also to use a lower voltage power supply, thereby generating less unwanted heat. However, an advantage which emerged from the use of LCD technology was that it was able to provide a wider field of view. This could provide sharper images and enable clearer vision at the edges of the picture, which will assist in strong crosswinds. It has also allowed the superimposition of images which are even more complex than basic symbology. The two main emerging possibilities are Enhanced Vision Systems, or EVS, and Synthetic Vision Systems, or SVS. In EVS, nose-mounted forward-looking infrared sensors detect approach and runway lights, which give out more heat than the background during low visibility approaches. At night, it builds up a heat picture of the entire forward view. This is a picture with the EVS switched off. Look at the runway. And now compare it with the same view a second later with the EVS on again. Synthetic vision systems display computer-generated graphics from a database. The image has to be presented as conformal, which requires a lot of computer capacity. And, of course, it is dependent on the database being correct and up-to-date. Both systems offer a lot of promise. EVS systems are in operational aircraft already, and SVS seems likely to follow once the problems of database integrity are resolved. 
Let's summarize this lesson. A head-up display is a method of presenting flight information and guidance so that it appears in the sightline of a pilot looking out of the windscreen. Its primary advantage is that a pilot does not have to transfer his gaze between the view ahead and the traditional head-down instruments, especially at a critical phase of flight. It is particularly useful during takeoff in low visibility conditions when only a few hundred feet of runway may be visible, but the pilot still wishes to see it, at least until airborne, before transferring to instruments. Similarly, on landing, especially on Category 3 ILS approaches, it enhances safety by allowing immediate reorientation to external information as soon as the runway becomes visible. First generation systems have four basic components. These are a display controller, a display guidance computer, an overhead unit, and a combiner. There is also an ambient light sensor. The light from the overhead unit is focused at infinity. This is achieved by designing the projector as a collimator. Conformity means that when a symbolic object is projected onto the combiner and the actual object that it represents is visible through the windscreen, they will be aligned. There are currently four generations of HUD technology. The first uses a cathode ray tube to generate the symbology. Second generation systems replace the cathode ray tube by a solid state light source, such as a liquid crystal display. Third generation systems remove the need for the overhead projector. Optical waveguides produce the image directly in the combiner. With these systems, eye reference point is less critical, since the eye box is larger. These are just emerging in aircraft. Fourth generation systems dispense with the combiner altogether. The entire windscreen is used as a transparent display. Every HUD will show information from the ADC, the IRUs, the radio altimeter, the radio navigation instruments and the FMS. However, the display guidance computer can also be programmed to show information from TCAS, wind shear warning, MLS and GPS if required. What is actually available on any particular display will depend on the manufacturer and the customer's requirements. We looked at various displays and some of their associated symbology. And concluded that basically just about any information generated within the aircraft can be displayed if the customer requires it. We mentioned two potential operating problems. And finally we looked at two promising emergent technologies. EVS and SVS. This concludes the lesson on the HUD.